Teddy and excited. Not Teddy and exciting, Teddy and excited. It was obviously, uh, he was a referee report why he rejected this paper. I have it somewhere. Uh, Give it this. Let me read. Decision. I do not recommend this paper for publication for the following reasons. One, the paper only gives an overview of the method of proof, so I cannot vouch for its correctness. I believe that every detail in the proof was spelled out. I was afraid to offend the reader by giving too many details, and here it tells me that there are not enough details. And now the second comment, which is really the same. Far too many aspects of this purported proof are essentially left as exercises to the reader. And I believe that everything was there. So in order to understand what was the misunderstanding of the very, I think it's part of this uh, myth that you cannot generalize, generalize from finitely many cases. So let's start with a warm-up. A completely rigorous proof of the following beautiful deep theorem. If you add up the first n cube, perfect cube, you get a beautiful answer. n times n plus 1 over 2 squared. <laughs> this is a beautiful theorem. And here is an even more beautiful proof. When n equals 0, you have the empty sum. The empty sum is 0. You plug n equals 0, you get 0 times 1 over 0, square 0. True for n equals 0. For n equals 1, you get 1 cube equals 1 times 2 over 2 squared, 1 squared, 1, 1 cube because 1 square equals 1, yeah! For n equals 2, you get 1 plus 8 equals question mark, 2 times 3 over 2 squared, uh, sorry, 1 plus cube, uh, 65, no, no, no. <laughs> one plus two cubes, sorry, nine. Okay. You see, my human is stupid. Computer will not make this mistake. Nine equals nine, yeah. And if it's three, let's go on here. One plus eight plus twenty-seven. Equal. 3 times 4 over 2 square, don't tell me, 36. 6 square, 36. Yeah, it's true for n equals 3. n equals 4. 1 plus 8 plus 27 plus uh, don't tell me 64 equals 4 times 5 over 2 square. By the way, a computer can do it in one nanosecond. This is only for illustrative reasons. A, a human computer. But it, and even some humans can do it faster than I can. Then you get 9 plus 27, 36 plus 64, 100 equals. 110 square, 100. Q, E, D! This is a completely rigorous proof. Why? Because this is the polynomial of degree 4, and this is the polynomial of degree 4. Two polynomials of degree 4 are identically equal if you can match them up in five different cases. And this is the main idea in this beautiful rejected paper in a much more sophisticated setting, of course. Proving the, the computer is guessing a polynomial, something that you know a priori should be a polynomial, and then proves certain recurrences. So this is a trivial example, but 
And here goes proof. Another example is a so-called Cassini identity. If you have the Fibonacci numbers, it's enough to check it for n equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. And that's a completely rigorous proof. You can do it by hand waving. Here is probably a bit more sophisticated. It belongs to a certain class of sequences satisfying certain linear recurrences. Fibonacci numbers satisfy a second order recurrence. It's easy to see that this satisfy a third order recurrence. So it's enough for this class to check for four different cases. If you check it for four, it's a completely rigorous proof. That by checking finally many cases. And there are lots and lots of other examples where checking finitely many cases is a rigorous proof. I call it the N0 principle. You can a priori determine a number N0 depending on the problem such that if you check it for all the integers between 0 and 0, then it consists a completely rigorous proof. Unfortunately, it's not applicable yet to all types of problems. For example, the following previous theorem. Let z sub n be the nth uh, non-trivial root of the Riemann zeta function. Then the real part of this of n equals one half for every integer n. This has been checked empirically by Andrew Disco and collaborators for more than a billion. Yet, as today, it's not yet a rigorous proof. There was no yet n zero for this. But I believe it's only a matter of time. And the billions of cases that Andrew Disco and collaborators computed is way, way in overkill. It's very possible that 100 will suffice once you can establish the N0 principle for the so-called Riemann hypothesis. But the paper we are going to talk about today is really a new approach for probability. I started about two years ago when using a computer, you can redo all classical probability and prove rigorous theorems, prove the central limit, limit theorem completely rigorously. So the article that that got rejected by the proceedings of the American Mathematical Society is in the same style, only a little bit more complicated. So let's have a crash course in probability theory. The central limit theorem is one of the, it's not called central limit theorem for nothing, it's the central theorem of probability theory. So let's have the simplest case for the sake of illustrations. You toss a coin and with probability one half you win a dollar. With probability, one half, you lose a dollar. So the so-called probability generating function of this is simply one half times x uh, plus x to the minus one. Meaning with probability one half, you have a dollar. With probability one half, you lose a dollar. Let's call this atomic thing, I don't know, f of x. The expected gain, of course, is zero. One half that you win a dollar, one half that you lose a dollar. The expectation is zero for this one single Bernoulli trial. Fair Bernoulli trial. It's a fair point. And the expectation, you take a second derivative, is, is, uh, is f, uh, f double prime of one. 
Tartu Wan.